Greetings, race community. Brent coming in live with today's guest, Erica Jordan, who serves as vice president for alumni engagement at Boston University. Welcome, Erica. Hi, Brent. So good to see you. Well, we first met on the West Coast. We are now working on Eastern time today, and I look forward to learning more about your professional journey. But before we get into work life, uh, we're going to go back in time a little bit just to learn a bit more about your own higher education journey. And so take me back to junior year of high school. Who was that, Erica? What was she into? And what led her to Howard University? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I have, I would say, I explained, I told that I, I was like the consummate Girl Scout. Um, I was a Girl Scout from the time I was a Daisy all the way through, you know, kind of senior year, silver award, kind of always that service oriented person, um, loved gathering people, being in groups. Um, I played softball in high school, uh, went on to play at Howard University. And um, so I've always been that team really like raw, raw person. And um, Howard for me was all about legacy. I had several members of my family who had gone to Howard that were very close to me, um, went to visit and it was like, I had to be there. And um, when I was there, very much was active in the California club. You know, we had a big contingency of us that would come every year, um, was an athlete, student athlete, um, was involved in yearbook. So very engaged and involved. And Howard has an amazing alumni network. So for me, it was always a space that um, I knew I had to work towards and, and, and work in. I just love people. So didn't necessarily think I would ever do alumni engagement, but definitely, um, can look back and go, okay, I see kind of the pieces starting to add up. And so were there three or four other contenders or was it sort of Howard or bust? Um, my, my top three was University of Miami, University of Rochester and, and Howard. Um, and Howard just took the cake for me. Well, it's great timing because by the time this episode airs, we will have just released an episode with David Bennett, who serves as VP uh, for, or Senior Vice President for Development and mm-hmm. Alumni Relations at Howard, which has had an unbelievable growth story over the last couple of years. I don't know how connected you are there, um, but it was just amazing to learn more about what has for sure always been a strong, tight-knit alumni community, but it seems like philanthropic uh, Lee has really just been a, a rocket ship over the last couple of years. Yeah, no, he's an amazing work. I mean, I give him a lot of credit. I think, you know, Howard, much like a lot of other HBCUs, philanthropy hasn't been something that was really ingrained in the student experience and the alumni experience. I think we all give our annual gifts, but it hadn't been something that we really knew why we, you know, we give back. And people like me who have been in philanthropy and uh, higher education for a long time, you know, I get it, but most of my friends didn't. And they'll go back from homecoming every year. They'll do all the activities, but there's no, that didn't necessarily connect into, you know, being a donor in any way. So he, I think has helped really broaden the perspective and show the why on many levels at at Howard. And so when you arrived, um, did you know you wanted to study psychology or was that something you picked up along the way? Um, I knew I wanted to study psychology. I thought I was going to be a child psychologist. Um, But as I got towards like more clinical stuff, I was like, I do not want to sit and listen to kids, you know, and that that was just emotionally. I knew I couldn't um, do that work. Um, I thought about changing my major to accounting. And my mom was like, you are not an accountant, Erica. You are (laughs) too, you know, not to put, you know, stereotype around accountants, but she was like, that's not your your field. So I ended up minoring in business because I did um, want that business sense and um, did enjoy accounting. And so um, minored in business, stay with um, psychology. And it really has been super impactful. Those, the marriage of those two for the work we do. And I think, you know, a lot of people don't talk about in our profession, how much you really, you know, are in people's, you know, in people's minds and thoughts and have to think about, you know, how do people think, how do people work? Um, and what's the business sense, you know, for those of us who worked in alumni engagement side, you know, having to operate a business sometimes if you are self-governed and then as we're doing annual giving and other giving, um, just really being able to understand what, you know, charitable gift annuities are. All those things all to me kind of have wrapped themselves well into my majors that I had at Howard. Well, I mean, even just like straight up listening. Absolutely. How important listening is to fundraising. And you could, I'm sure, draw parallels to, uh, a therapy session and a qualification visit, uh, depending on who you're meeting with. Sure. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And so recognizing that you, you, you were heading in one direction, interested in child psychology, 
pivot along the way, pick up a little bit of focus in business. How did how did the actual what do I do when I graduate sort of um, you know, how did that process unfold for you? Yeah. So I thought that I was going to graduate and go back to grad school because at that point I still very much saw, you know, my understanding of psychology kind of brought and I thought I would go into more of like organizational development. Again, I, you know, really love building teams, love, you know, what drives people and I am um, and drive success. And, I, and what I ended up happening is I graduated um, and I wasn't really interested in grad school anymore. And so I uh, started down the sales route um, in corporate sales. I didn't, it was very like business to business, like that, like, oh, let me call and find the athlete who can do sales. That was, that was me. I got looped into that, did not like it at all, but um, got into politics for, for a while. For your advancement colleagues who are listening, who have maybe thought at times, hey, maybe I could do sales or sales could be a good path. <laughs> I mean, those entry level programs can be pretty intense. I mean, what what were some of like what was the dynamic and uh, I don't know, what were some of the highlights or the biggest yeah. challenge? Yeah. I mean, so this is also 2003. So, I mean, you're not talking about sales that had like a bunch of computers you're sitting at. We're talking about we had a couple of computers that everyone shared. You're picking up the phone. You're trying to get appointments um, for computer and phone services. Again, like not the biggest, and I just, that like cold call was was not, I was never in student philanthropy center. So for me, picking up a phone out of, you know, in a phone book, just going through and trying to get visits was not at all um, the good work. And then, you know, you have, you know, when I would go on visits, I had a great, I mean, I had a great close rate, but that cold calling was just painful, um, painful, painful. And now sitting in my seat, you know, I, and, and working in the front line for a long time, you know, it's a different, like, I realize I see the connection between the, you know, being a salesperson and um, the work we do, but just, I think there's something about the connectivity that our alums, our parent donors and others have to our universities that completely changes the dynamic of picking up a call and saying, Hey, would you love to have a conversation about your philanthropy to, to be you? Yeah. I think it's easy to talk about sort of cold leads in the context of alumni and development work, but fair to say that the coldest leads at BU or Howard are probably smoking hot compared to <laughs> some of the leads that you were working with uh, earlier yeah. on. So it's a hundred, a hundred times warmer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, a, it was a fun journey. I mean, I went from there to working in politics for probably about five years, really enjoyed my time there. I worked for the LA city council as well as um, did some campaign work and, you know, that was that was to me where I really got my training ground on what does outreach really look like? What does, you know, really harnessing, um, you know, kind of putting psychology into play? You know, what are again, how do people think? What are what are the drivers of people um, motivations, I guess, um, around a lot of different things? And so, you know, both campaign work was intense, but it really did. You know, you kind of have this finite period of time where you had to stand something up and, you know, the parallels between that and the parallels in um, kind of higher education campaigns, you start to see that, you know, the constituencies are a little different. They're a shorter period of time in politics, but it's the same thing. You really have to think about your constituencies. How do they, um, what motivates them, you know, what draws them in um, and how do you, how do you motivate them to give? And so that was, again, short lived. And I moved from there into nonprofit work and, um, I was doing galas for a large nonprofit, the Fulfillment Fund, which was really, really heartwarming and great. Um, my former boss, Stacey Seligman, who's at USC, um, just was an amazing kind of mentor to me over time. And she was running the thing. There wasn't much room for me to grow. That's how I got to USC. And I worked at USC for about eight years doing both, starting off in the events world um, at the School of Business, moving into fundraising. And wow, I mean, USC is it is what it, you know, I, I was there, I feel like during a golden time where it was on its rise and we did some amazing programs. I learned a ton at, at USC, um, both on alumni engagement and fundraising. And so for those who aren't as familiar with the Fulfillment Fund, I'm reading the description. It's dedicated to making college a reality for students growing up in educationally and economically under-resourced communities, which is sort of, you know, deeply aligned with almost every advancement Mm -hmm. shops mission out there, um, obviously not directly inside higher ed, but it seems like enabling that journey. And um, did that just kind of click right away relative to some of the other work that you had done? And, and is that what led you to kind of think about advancement as a career path? 
Absolutely. Um, you know, I really did, you know, I think I'm not the service oriented side. So, you know, I wouldn't be on the student affairs side. The same thing there. We had mentor programs. There was, you know, definitely direct programs that helped the students get into college. Um, but to me to fuel that um, and being able to empower um, others to rally around the work that our um, practitioners were doing, that to me was so exciting. And, um, you know, pulling off events with, you know, the fulfillment fund was very much was anchored in the entertainment business. And so, you know, we would do these events and have, you know, such an out pouring of support from all over the Los Angeles community, again, mainly entertainment. And then that equal out to, you know, there are students that, you know, we had, we were paying for buses for students from, you know, East LA or South LA who had never been to the beach. That's like 10 miles from their home and never seen the beach. And to have those moments where students are putting their feet in the sand for the first time or taking them to LMU to um, experience a day at college, like those things just warm your heart so much. I knew that, you know, higher education or some sort of nonprofit work in the philanthropy world was, was going to be where I was going to rest my hat for the long haul. And so you go to USC specifically working at the business school, which mm -hmm. is definitely a, a you know, a sub constituency within the broader um, community, spend your initial period of, of time focused on more of the engagement work, but mm -hmm. then ultimately had the opportunity to move into more of a, a direct fundraising role. And I'm just curious, um, you know, thinking about events as just like the, the classic engagement sort of strategy, but then moving your way towards fundraising, was it, which is kind of like moving back towards your, your sales role, obviously different, you know, context, but yeah. was that um, an aspiration out of the get-go or, or did it just sort of happen? It just sort of happened. I honestly was probably the classic person of, I never want to ask for money. Like, you know, it just felt icky. And, um, you know, being at USC, you realize that the Trojan spirit is just so there. And at the, I was, you know, always at all, you know, doing all the events. And when you're there, you just naturally just start talking to people about what they're doing, about the philanthropy. It just started to come naturally. And I realized if you know what you're talking about, you're really just leading people through a journey and conversation for something they're already going to do. And so um, it was, it was, you know, a director at the time said to me, would you ever consider a frontline role? And I was like, uh, I don't want to leave my, if I hate it, then what happens? And she was like, I promise you won't hate it. Just try it out. And so um, she really pushed me to try um, to come in to our giving program at the time it was called Marshall Partners. And you know, I had to, our our goal was to raise you know a couple million dollars you know uniquely in our different regions um, and really work with volunteers. So I, and I love that piece of it. I love the fact that I was still going to be in a role where we were still working with volunteers, still doing events um, that were more exclusive, um, but then really had you know to to still raise money. And but those again, that was not a hard. It, it didn't become a hard ask. And as I started moving more towards major giving ask, that's where you know it really became okay. How do I make sure so it's not as easy as asking for fifty thousand dollars? And now I'm asking for a million. And I think that, you know, USC just prepared me so much for the, the mindset there was really, if you're asking somebody for a dollar, you can ask them for a million dollars. It's the same ask. You still have to be prepared and know what the impact of that giving is going to be. And if you can explain that and ensure you're having that, um, you know, who they are and what they are, what they want to give to you, you can get them a million dollars just as easy as that, that dollar, which I know is very simplified, but it, you know, really gives you, gives you that confidence to walk in and, and do the work. So if you could go back to your first month or two or first quarter on the job yeah. in that Marshall Partners fundraising role and sit that Erica down and coach her up knowing what you know now, what are the one or two things you would tell yourself? Um, I think I was such a great question. I think I would tell her to be patient and that the ride you have to go through, there's no skipping steps. You have some of the things that you're going to go through um, as frustrating as they could be. Um, and while you may not understand them, we're going to prepare you for where you're going to be a day. Um, and I say that because I think oftentimes when we're junior level fundraisers, you know, we want to become major gift officers quickly or we want to, you know, we, we think we can do it all. And there's something that there's something about in any of our roles going through the mud a couple of years and really understanding the process. Um really mean something. And, you know, those, there was years I was at USC with Marshall Partners where we had to rebuild and, you know, really 
you know, you you do you, you start broadening what you're doing. You're not just doing the the ask and the events. You start getting you know much more into the data analytics. And we were doing some early things off a of spreadsheet. But you know, there's there's pieces of that that I feel like if I hadn't sucked the course, and you know, there was times where I thought I should have been promoted sooner and faster. And um, I realized that the opportunity that I was being presented, even at my level, has now paid off. You know, hundredfold. And I know it's not advice around giving, but to me, it's, I think advice to universally that any of us can take is, you know, find that core, those core years and really invest in yourself. Cause I, I know that I've had opportunity to leapfrog sometimes because I was prepared in the roles I spent a little bit more time in. Love that. Um, and, and I'm sure, you know, it's, it's, it also, I'm sure gives you empathy for the young, hungry, ambitious mm-hmm. fundraiser that wants that promotion, but also yeah. some perspective in, that sometimes, um, you know, fast isn't, isn't always the best, the best yeah. path. Um, I am curious when you think about that time in the field, are there any memorable experiences, you know, gifts you're particularly proud of, or yeah. frankly, you know, crash and burn experiences too, <laughs> which, which occasionally get shared um, that really stand out during your yeah, time? Yeah, no, I think one of my favorite gifts, you know, there's, so many memorable, memorable gifts at USC, but there was, I was doing some, I was just got assigned to doing New York and um, I was just surfing through lists. And at the time, you know, we weren't really assigned a whole lot of people at that junior level. Um, and I noticed that there's a gentleman who had given $12,500 two times within like a month of itself, but no one had caught it. No one had added them up to go, this person gave $25,000, which at the time back then was a major gift. And so I went out, I met with him um, and thanked him for his gift. And he was like, you know, this he was like, done, he had just done on his own. Yeah. On his own. There was no prompt for it. It had been several years since he had made the gift. No one had come out to thank him because again, it looked like it was more like an annual gift. And so I thanked him and, you know, we had a great conversation. Um, I quickly recognized that he had far more capacity um, than that. And I think those were kind of a tester gifts that we honestly had failed um, to steward. And so I brought on my um, my colleague who um, is still at USC, the major gifts role, um, Sarah Perrin Murphy. And she, I said, we need to, to meet with this gentleman. And um, over the course of the years, I know she stewarded several seven figure gifts from him. And we, honestly, I don't think we would um, surface him because he was busy in other, his, I think his wife's um, I'm a mater, he, you know, he kind of just got distracted and wasn't really kind of tapped in. But now I know he's very engaged and involved. And as I graduated with my master's from USC, I started going to events again and saw him there. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was so good to see him in person. And, you know, he, he remembered, he was like, you know, you brought me back into the fold and really appreciate it. So while, you know, I didn't get the glory per se of the, some of the bigger gifts, I still feel like just the the work sometimes doing the digging and doing that work um the uncover people is so gratifying to see what their what their long term journey could be with us i mean i love the example and i hate the example because it's like <laughs> how do we ensure and this is where i feel like i take responsibility for all of the money that has in that been invested in research and data and analytics and crm and all these things it still comes down to Erica scanning a list, seeing a pattern and going and acting upon it. And and so on one hand, like we have to figure out a way to make it impossible for people like that to fall through the cracks Absolutely, because the cost of of that missed opportunity literally is is millions of dollars in in hundreds or maybe someday thousands of lives. Um, And then it also makes me think about a point that I feel like I'm repeating, you know, ad nauseum these days, which is really the intersection of stewardship and discovery. Absolutely. How do we shorten that cycle? Today, the way the way most organizations are set up, they are totally separate things. I'm on the stewardship team, which honestly is sort of backwards looking, right? Like I want yeah. to recognize for the past and inform you of the impact and so forth. Whereas discovery is all forward looking. Right. And, and I just, it just feels like one of those areas where there's such an opportunity for more strategic alignment. 
Yeah. And Brent, I think I would even back you up even further. You know, I do 100% agree that stewardship has to be a part of it. And I would say, you know, one thing I know I'm blessed with here um, at BU is that we have a stewardship team with our annual giving team, as, you know, and there is a greater stewardship program. But even, you know, one thing I've been really empowering my team since I got, got here a year ago was our alumni team your engagement officers, to me, they spend time with volunteers every single day. And if they're not listening and understanding the clues that can move the, the cultivation process along faster or understand, you know, that they have a role in that discovery, it's huge. I mean, I think there's, you can't just start it at annual giving or with leadership annual giving officers. It has to start further back and understand that we all should be meeting. And if we're doing prospect development, you know, meetings for a region, Include your alumni team in that, you know, include your stewardship team or how are we all thinking about the people who are popping their heads up in these various ways. And oftentimes I think it's just missed opportunities because we, we, we kind of work in a silo within our um, divisions. And but I'm, I'm already seeing that when we work together, we're finding so many more people who, you know, major gift teams not ready for the major gift, you know, prospects yet. So bring them down and let us properly steward them. If we know that in game, we can all can work together for better success. And I think, you know, data analytics is such an important thing. And I think for many years, you know, we were such an arts kind of world in terms of fundraising, but bringing that science in. And I, you know, I always encourage people if they're, you know, not using amazing products, um, you know, like every two you just you're missing out on the ability to pull up and pull out people that you just wouldn't find. It doesn't have to be as hard as it used to be um, to uncover a list because there's, there's tools that will help you do it so seamlessly. And, you know, look, we, we have, thank you for the kind of words. We have a long way to go, but, but I, you know, what we are talking about all the time is just the intersection of engagement and as you were describing and discovery and ensuring that that handoff happens. Like if a hundred people come to an event, there's no possible way that they should be getting the same post event experience. But right. in a lot of cases, that is the way it's done today. Mm -hmm. You take the attendee list, you put it into the campaign, you hit send and we move on. And it's like, how do we start, you know, with this idea of, of, of rules and intelligence. So if a hundred people register, there are one or two or three people that are going to stand out and warrant a extra level special of post event follow-up. And then right. the next 10 people might have a different level of personalization. And then maybe for everybody else, that's where the more generic mass email, you know, comes into play. And then how do we apply that to every single event? you know, every single campaign, every single experience. And um, yeah, Brent, uh, if I can share one thing, I mean, just to uh, your kind of put an exclamation point on your, your point there, when I was at UCI, um, one thing we were doing on our annual giving team was, you know, we had so many non-donors and, and, you know, I'm like, we can't boil the ocean. So how do we start to tackle this? So we decided to come up with a 10,000 donor um, cohort and we had, you know, part A and part B and we would test different things with the group. But at the end of the day, this cohort got, you know, special letters, special treatment. They got invited to certain events and everything was tracked so seamlessly. Um, the amount of people we got to convert because it wasn't just about, let me send you six, you know, direct mail pieces and have a phone call you, but you no, know, you're going to get a phone call saying, Hey, be my special guest at this event. You're going to get a volunteer to call you to say, would you like to come out? But everything was so perfectly coordinated. Um, you know, one of our biggest success out of that was a very similar thing where we had a $10,000 check come in and for UCI, that's a big deal to get a check, you know, from a direct mail piece, but all of this, the work we did to make sure that people were actively hearing, not just from us on giving, but this cohort got all kind of engagement that gentleman went on to give a substantial gift to UCI during this current campaign. And, but it just was that seamless work. And I think people do have to think about what's that work you're doing pre-event. I think people will spend on events all day long and yes, yeah, so you can check boxes and add to your numbers of number of people at the end of the year who came to stuff. But if you're not thinking about events from the start of the year going, who's that cohort we want to meet? Who's that missing middle that we, we don't have in our pipeline and how do we target them and think about what can the alumni team do? What can annual giving do? What can major gifts team do? What can stewardship do? And have all those pieces work together on a plan. You're going to, to me, you're going to net more people than trying to invite 200,000 people to an event and pray that you get some good, get some good folks out of it. Uh, no doubt. And and I, I feel like that's where, yeah, just the, the assembly line experience, we still have so, so far to go in, in this space where, um, you know, success can't be number of attendees or number of likes or number of watches or any of that stuff. 
all of that is a leading indicator for who might then be able to take the next step and just yeah. having that sort of seamless handoff and the routing. Yeah. I know it's possible. I know that there's progress being made and, and even around, you know, just thinking about, um, what the first time donor experience is, for example, I know a lot of institutions, including BU has done a great job, just rethinking what's the first time donor experience, what's the 20th year in a row experience. And, yeah. and, you know, we're not going to, um, fix it all overnight. I do, I do want to know more about that. Uh, you know, oftentimes like AB testing is, is done in the context of, I'm going to send an email to two groups of people with two different subject lines. And that's the AB test. But it sounds like your approach was more a full year long campaign experience for cohort A versus cohort B. Right. And one of the amazing things right about annual giving is it is so measurable, you can actually really see what the difference is. Yet I feel like that kind of full year programmatic AB testing is, is pretty rare. Yeah, and it, it takes a lot of work. And I think you really have to have the team that's willing to stick with it in the data. Um, and no, yeah, I mean, I, I was that, what I'll say is that my team was so ready to do this that, you know, we had the team who could really think about data a little differently. And um, it took the time what we looked at was, you know, who almost like an overlay, like who are the schools at, at UCI who had, you know, some of the top, you know, density of giving who, what was the age group, you know, what was, so we looked at all these kind of like qualifying factors of our current um, pool of people with some of the reunion years, um, although we didn't have a reunion program, we were trying to try to see if people were kind of almost naturally um, giving spikes during those years, um, or could we help drive it during those years a little bit more? And as we did the overlay, it became very crystal clear what our profile of potential donor looked like. And so again, acquisition is so expensive. And to me, if you're not doing it with the hand of, you know, let me look profile my current, you know, my current um, giving base and looking for some of those gaps, right? Like we we knew that we were missing some schools that just didn't have the giving it needed to be. Well, maybe if we profile them the same way, could we increase some of those. We had some wins, some losses, but overall, you know, we uncovered quite a few uh, people that just wouldn't, you know, in the long haul. I mean, it's not always about that major gift because we did have some of those, but even our, this general pool of people just increased um, pretty significantly for us. Well, while that work was happening, our paths first crossed. I remember the first time that I visited UC Irvine on campus because it's to this day, one of the most amazing spaces that I yes. think I've ever been in on a college campus. It was called The Cove. Yes. It's a really cool innovation center. Mm -hmm. And what I recall from that meeting, two things. One, there were a lot of people. Uh, two, you really championed engagement as a campaign objective mm -hmm. at UCI. And I know you've continued to take that with you. And I know you're um, a leader within the Council for Alumni Association executives community as well. And I just would like to learn more about the background and the catalyst to get sort of first class representation of engagement next to the big numbers that always get highlighted in a campaign. Yeah, you know, I think it really, for me, it really started, you know, at US, UCI, um, my predecessor, he was at UBC for a while and UBC had a big dual goal campaign. Um, and while he left, you know, I just, it stuck with me. It was one of those things where I'm like, we, UCI was at the time, maybe 51 years old. So we're very young base. We were teaching our alums how to be alumni. And I'm like, well, they don't even know why they should give yet. They don't know how they should behave. And to me, it was our magic moment. If we were doing a campaign and our camp, the, the first campaign UCI had done was really more community-based. Most of the donors were from the community. They weren't alumni. Alumni weren't really mature enough to even give at those levels. I thought that if we framed this right, we can really get our, you know, over the course of a seven-year campaign, if we're starting off an alumni engagement goal and then moving people into um, becoming big donors, that to me felt more like a warm hug from us than, hey, we're doing this campaign, you know, of, you know, two, $3 billion. And you made already this loose people because like, I don't see myself, you know, being able to help with that number at all. And so as we started putting together, we got our board really involved in our team. We recognized there was such a nice growth pattern already happening with our engagement. You know, what if we supercharged that and really had those four big buckets and we were right 
I think we launched our campaign right before Case put out their, their four buckets of engagement. And so we were right there with them. And um, it just has been so exciting to see how much people have responded towards it. And even here at BU, um, you know, there's, we're growing the culture of, of engagement here too. And there's a lot of people who are interested in the work. I would say there's, if I would implore anyone who has the ability to really fight for a dual goal in their campaign, it's, I don't care what maturity level you're at, you know, our alums rarely see themselves personally in a billion dollar plus campaign. It is just such a big number. But when you you say to them, you know what, I don't care if you're giving or well, we care, but we, we want you to give, we want you to come to things, we want you to do all these things. And, you know, one thing we're working on here at BU is an annual alumni checklist. So, you know, you're checking through all the boxes. Did you give on giving day? Did you give your annual gift? Did you come to an event? Really just in every year, refreshing that for them and saying, here's how we want you to engage. We're hoping that that will drive um, so much more activity during our next campaign that will be, be coming up. Um, another university that's doing it really well right now is University of Toronto. If anyone's um, checking out for what, how you can spell it out, they have a dual goal um, that has a sub belly goal of um, a million touches from their alumni over the course of the campaign. And so there's a lot of engagement right now from other universities who are trying to boost that alumni engagement up with their campaign goal. Within your CAAE or broader peer group, what are you hearing as the argument against it? Because it seems like such a no-brainer, um, but it's still relatively uncommon, though becoming more and yeah. more common. But what's the argument against it? It's hard to track. It's distracting. Yeah. I mean, like what, why, why wouldn't a board, yeah. a president, a leadership team want to have a dual goal? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of, I think everyone would say there's no argument why someone wouldn't want it. I think what the hardest piece is that, you know, surprisingly, there's still a lot of shops that don't know how to attract track their engagement um, and haven't been effectively tracking it. Although I would argue that there's a lot of retroactive tracking we can do that people just need to almost take a step back, either hire a consultant, which I know is you know not always easy, or students to help go back even a couple of years through that quiet phase. But I think most of it is data tracking. And then I think often there's not, you know, we're a centralized uh, campus here. I think for those alumni associations who are either self-governed, um, or maybe interconnected, sometimes that seat at the table for alumni associations doesn't always exist. And so to really be able to push the message of the why can be a little more challenging. Um, but I, I do think that there's enough schools who have had the campaigns and um, at the Case Leader Summit this past summer, there was a session on it. And I think there's so much opportunity to take those benchmarking and say, and plop it on somebody's desk and go, this is the results. There's so many schools that are showing how people's giving has, has significantly changed um, by just tracking their alumni engagement through donation, through the campaign that I think it's, you know, the argument that we're not tracking our data correctly or the argument that you don't have that proximity, I think we have to fight a little harder to um, to, to make the case. Um, it's not going to be easy. Well, I think back to the earlier part of our conversation, we have to, I think there's merit for having the dual goal, but then being able to connect the dots between why um, not just like theoretically engagement leads to fundraising, but by having a dual engagement goal and engaging, I'm making up a number, 25,000 people in our community, yep. we are then going to be able to filter down that 25,000 to identify the next best set of plan giving prospects. Absolutely. Un unmanaged, you know, prospects in the Northeast. Uh, maybe there's school and unit priorities that then we can surface by way of you know, event programming aligned with those schools, units, or other priority areas, we're going to allow people to raise their hand, express interest. And then part of the follow-up strategy is qualification and assignment to the frontline team. And I think that's just the missing link that sometimes alumni relations professionals, alumni engagement professionals get uncomfortable with because they don't love the idea of, wait, I'm going to have a hundred people come to an event and then 10 of them are going to get assigned and they're going to, you know, be chased down by a fundraiser tomorrow, but that is the name of the game here. They wouldn't show up to the event if they don't care. And yep. it's our job to, maybe of the 10, none of them want to be philanthropically engaged, mm -hmm. but we would be doing a disservice to the community to not at least find out. Yeah. And we have to think about it too, from young alumni. Our young alumni are giving so much sooner than our, our older alumni at every university. Like, I don't think anyone would argue that the 25 year old, um, you know, current alum is giving probably a hundred dollars more 
than they than the probably 10, 15 years ago that a 25 year old would. And I think things like a dual goal really will catapult that 25 year old, 30 year old into saying, okay, well, my university cares about more than just money to care about how I'm experiencing them as a, you know, as an alum, that's to me going to push that next wave and next generation of donors to be giving so much sooner um, at higher levels and just have a bigger pool. I mean, so much of us, so many of us are fighting for that middle of our, our pipeline. And to me, that's part partially a product of not having alumni engagement be an active part of um, our donor journeys and just in, thinking young alums aren't going to give. And I, I do think there's a correlation between um, a dual goal and really doing it well and bringing along the next generation of young alumni donors. All right, Erica. So you endured the sweltering mid-Atlantic summers. Yeah. Then it's palm trees and good vibes in Southern California. Yep. Big move to come yeah. back to uh, New England. And so, you know, I'd love to just know more about that process, you know, how it came about and what ultimately inspired you to um, to take this opportunity as leading, uh, leading the alumni engagement team, which I read in your announcement of your position was very intentional to call it alumni engagement yeah. and not alumni relations. Maybe you can touch on that too, but first, yeah. why be you? Yeah. So, you know, BU is, you know, reputationally on the West Coast, it's huge. There's, and when, now that I'm here, I recognize that our third largest population is in Los Angeles. So that, you know, speaks to a lot of that, but, you know, I was perfectly happy at UCI, you know, had a great setup and really loved my team and uh, my boss there. Um, when the recruiters called, you know, they, I was really hesitant. They're like, you know what, just take the call. We promise it just, you know, just hear, hear out the opportunity. And, um, I did. And as I talked to Dr. Brown, who was a very early part of the conversation, President Brown, his vision for alumni engagement and really that shift. I mean, he really wanted for him, alumni relations was really kind of a tried and true older school style of, you know, we have we will have an event in each of our regions, very low tech. And he really wanted, you know, he asked his first question to me, what do you see as alumni engagement? What's the difference? And I talked a lot about a, really a two-way relationship with our alums that has to be based in technology. It has to be, you know, both, both virtual and um, on the ground. It has to be volunteer driven. And so him and I really connected around that. And it was really the first time I had a really in-depth conversation with a university president who was so invested in alumni engagement and willing to put money behind ensuring that it was properly sized, properly resourced that it was, I was kind of like, well, this is a unique opportunity. It was also centrally, centrally managed. And so I knew our team here would be, you know, all in kind of in a good working order. Um, so my overall team, you know, I have alumni engagement, but I also have annual giving, I have development communications and development events. And so all those working parts really do create and create a big ecosystem that I knew that we could take things um, to the next level and do them well. And so it really became an opportunity that I just couldn't pass up. The fact that the president was, you know, he had, by that point, he had already um, been an alumni engagement task force, bringing together some of the members of the trustees, some of the alumni board to say, you know, they benchmarked pretty deeply across their peers and did a lot of surveying. And so he pretty much handed me some results of a, of a you know, pretty, about a year, a little over a year was worth of work that the team had done and said, you know, you can take as much of this as you want, but kind of build your plan forward. And um, it was really hard to turn, turn away from that. It's, you know, it's been chillier, a little grayer than, you know, I'm used to living in California for most of my life. But at the same time, I, you know, my team is so hungry for the work we're going to do. And, um, you know, we're really setting ourselves up really well to, you know, to, for me to be a leader in, in kind of that next level of engagement. Well, I'm seeing a recurring pattern in your career, which is really around growth. I mean, being at USC during a tremendous time of growth, yeah. UCI during a tremendous time of growth, and BU has just been a complete rocket ship yeah. as it relates to both engagement and fundraising over the last 15 years and President Brown's you know, tenure. I know that's been a huge yeah. part of, of his focus as well. Um, and so as you, as you think about kind of, well, actually, I, I have to ask, you also accepted the role 
at a unique moment where like the pandemic was still in flight here. I mean, did you even have the opportunity to travel to campus? I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I had been to BU a couple of years ago. Like I had been to Boston a couple of times before, but no, my entire process was online and it moved very fast. I mean, in a normal world for this level position, you know, it could take months and months and months because you're trying to get on the provost calendar, the president's calendar. And that process in person can be, you know, hard. And this, because it was zoom, it was like, you know, a matter of weeks. And I was like, okay, well, this, this happened a lot faster than I thought it was going to happen. Um, but, it, you know, I would say, would I have done it again if I had opportunity to come on campus? Probably, you know, probably would have wanted to come on campus. I don't know that it would change my decision. I think there's so much that, you know, people really, like during that pandemic time, people really leaned into a really great virtual experience. And, um, you know, I couldn't really, couldn't really ask for a better process and, um, and onboarding when I got here. Well, I know part of your vision, um, and, and it was sort of inevitable at the time you were being recruited, but but you definitely had an appreciation for just what the future of an alumni engagement might entail, hybrid, in-person. You're now in sort of a more normal, let's call it post-pandemic um, planning environment, you know, as we kick off fiscal 23 here. And I am curious, kind of where are things settling out? Sort of what what aspects of this year of 2023 maybe look or feel a lot like 2019 and then which aspects of your programming are completely different and maybe informed by the more digital world we're, we're living in? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we, where we, what I'll say it looks more like pre-pandemic is we're definitely getting back out there in person um, in a bigger way than what we um, probably anticipate at this point where, you know, we're rolling our president back out kind of um, in a big way this fall and early this spring, we've had some great in-person visits. People really want to get back out. Um, we, BU had not really been volunteer driven for this last couple of years. And so a lot of my team's energy is in working to build up our volunteer networks, um, our alumni networks, our young alumni programming. Um, my team has heard me mention probably a hundred times over and they're probably tired of me saying it, but I truly believe if we're going to build a strong alumni engagement program, you have to start from the time a student's admitted. Um, and so we're really, really focused on what are those experiences year over year from the time a student's admitted all the way through um, at least their first five years to almost concretely, you know, put their feet in the ground as, um, you know, alums that are going to be active and um, looking at technology through all those pieces. I think you cannot do it by just saying, we hope you come to an event. It has to be, you know, what are you using? What's your platform and how are you engaging people around mentorship? You know, are you giving people a chance to work in um, task groups, work groups that are helping you solve some of your biggest problems um, that you have. And it doesn't always have to be on your board. It can just be general volunteers that are um, sticking their hands up or alums that are participating in something. You know, how are you kind of creating these micro opportunities for people to come in and out of engagement? Um, and I would say, you know, when I look, think about, about annual giving, you know, one of the things we're starting to look at is digital gift officers. Again, we, we're never going to have enough staff to, for the alumni size we have, we're not going to have enough staff on the ground to help the pipeline. Um, and so on our annual giving, kind of leadership annual giving team, we're looking at bringing on the DXO model and really hoping that um, we can reach a much wider audience. And I truly believe that, you know, frontline gift officers are never going away. They are there, you know, as a big career um, piece, but we can digitally engage people in a really strong way. I think that the pandemic has shown us that virtual events work. People are willing to engage with us virtually. Um, and then some people just will never meet with you in person. So why not create this, you know, same conversation um, in, a, in a digital space and, and utilize the insights that we have to have, create better virtual conversations with folks. So we're very much right now rooted in technology. Um, you know, we're looking at a Salesforce conversion. There's all the pieces. I just, so many things were kind of under the hood, making sure that in two years, we can really say we have all the things we can to, to really kind of kick off the next campaign to, to kind of soar for the alumni engagement. Well, I think one of the unique um, opportunities for a place like BU, first of all, the geographic diversity that you've described, I mean, having the West Coast as the third largest um, area, almost 10,000 alumni in San Francisco, LA, et cetera. But you also have 5,000 alumni in the United Kingdom and yeah. 4,000 in India and yeah. the Middle East, there's a really strong presence. And, and I, I am hopeful that like, there is no reason that that sort of virtual discovery model, the DXO model cannot scale globally as well. 
Right. Um, I don't think we've really gone there yet, but but that should be something that we certainly keep in mind. Right. And I know that's been an area where BU's had tremendous strength from an international fundraising perspective. But even as you think about the intersection of engagement and philanthropy around, you know, volunteerism globally, I mean, one of our experiences that that I've referenced a couple of times, like I have served on the board of the Brown University Football Association. That's been very fulfilling for me. But up until the pandemic, our approach was to have board meetings a couple times a year before football games. Well, guess what? Not that convenient for most people to get to Providence. And then we'd have the, you know, the conference phone in the center of the table with horrible audio that nobody could hear who wasn't in the meeting. Right. And then when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden we hosted that first one on Zoom and it was like the most amazing <laughs> experience. And so that's an example where I'm like, Please don't go back to absolutely the way we used to do it. I don't care what volunteer program, like have it at a lunchtime, you know, East Coast, 9 a.m. West Coast, do it via Zoom, let people see each other, engage with each other. Like, no, like let's not go back to those habits. I 100% agree. And, you know, BU has been, you know, I think an international leader and alumni, international alumni engagement for a long time. And we just had a meeting with all of our um, alumni leaders in, in Asia. And it was such a powerful meeting. And as we're planning for their, um, they do a business forum every other year, this one's going to be online again. And they were like, this is great. The Friday night before though, in their own places, they'll have some sort of in-person reception, but the main crux of the event is going to be virtual. And they're so excited about it because now they don't have to worry about traveling into a different country. Um, we'll have opportunities for them to, to network and engage across, you know, the entire entirety of the day. We'll have speakers that are, you know, will be pre-recorded, but then come in live for um, some talks. And it really does, I think, virtual space just creates such a, you know, world of opportunity. I hate using the pun, but um, I think it really does open up a whole nother level of engagement. And I 100% agree with you. I think GXL model, at least for us, would work well because we have such a warm international alumni base. Right. I, I, I'm optimistic. They're going to be like thrilled yeah. to have that conversation and, and maybe even in some cases almost prefer that you're not spending all that time and money to, yes. you know, travel just to, just to see them in person. Like they might not, yeah. not everybody needs that level of, of personalization, I guess. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure with the time that we have remaining, we get yeah. to touch on a couple of topics. Um, one mentorship and two, your team. Yeah. Um, experience with mentorship. I know the advancement sector is super tight knit. Yeah. The CAA community tight knit. I know yeah. you're tight with Mo Cotton Kelly. Yeah. You've mentioned Brian Hervey at UCI, but just what's your sort of experience been with mentorship? You know, I, I don't think any of us would be where we are, you know, in our profession without it. Um, I truly believe I sit in the seat here at BU because someone mentioned my name and it was someone who likely, you know, has either been a mentor to me or, um, you know, just I, I always what I like to say is that I keep your five people that you have close. You know, they don't have to be your mentor, but one of them probably should be a mentor. But who are those five people you can call with? You know, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling with this concept, this idea or our president wants to do this. I don't really know how to wrap my mind around it or what's going on with you? How can I be helpful? And, you know, I really do take pride in keeping track and as, as many people as possible. CAAE is such a warm community. I try to, like, I don't miss it ever um, because it just is an amazing community, but I do have those folks um, within that community and within annual giving um, that really just, you know, it, they really put your, they put, they mention your name in places. They help you continue to push you to think better, think differently, tell you what books to read. And, um, you know, Julie, um, Julie Decker at, um, at Florida, she's always like, Erica, have you read this book yet? If not, have your team read it. And it's like, those are the moments you want. Those are the things that, that kind of partnership you can have, but we're not competing with each other. Whether you're on the advancement side or alumni engagement, we don't compete. We're, we're all here, um, to serve our, our own alumni groups. And all we can do is just get better together. So, um, you know, Ryan Hervey from the start of his tenure at UCI was always a great mentor to me and someone that I value our relationship forever. I love that. And yeah, it's such a recurring theme and, and uh, we'll make sure that they, they hear, uh, hear those shout outs for sure. Um, tell me a little bit about the team today. Mm -hmm. Are you hiring, growing? Why should folks keep an eye on the jobs page 
over at BU? Yeah, we are hiring um, in a major way. We are preparing for our next campaign. We are staffing up for sure. Um, I am looking to hire for marketing communications folks. We are hiring digital gift officers. Um, we are hiring a director of leadership annual giving really all around. Um, we've also made some amazing hires recently. So I would say, you know, I think I'm fun to work for, but I think even some of the leaders that we've been hiring, um, Daniel Reddy from um, MIT just joined us and is leading our alumni engagement efforts under me. Um, we just hired, um, uh, we just hired Kelly Sullivan from Texas, who's now our senior director of uh, annual giving. She's a powerhouse, someone that, you know- That's amazing. To, I hadn't heard that. I that. know. I'm so excited. Um, but if you're looking and to, you know- she, Is she in, in Boston? She or? is. She's in Boston. Yeah. So we're, I would say, you know, our, our leadership team is just growing and really um, if you're looking to look, work in a kind of innovative, innovative, dynamic, nimble place, we're, we're that shop. And I do hope we um, continue to be one of the best teams out there. I love it. Well, it's been a, an absolute privilege to collaborate with um, your colleagues over the years and, and to be able to collaborate with you in this role. And I hope that everybody will, um, follow along with, with the continued growth story at BU. If folks want to be in touch with you, Erica, I know you're yes. active on LinkedIn. Any other yeah. um, recommendations for, for ways to get in touch? I'm always on email. I'm, I'm enjordan at bu.edu. Feel free to reach out. I'm always here. I love connecting. So, and thank you for the opportunity. Love it. Love it. Well, um, I will uh, uh, start to wrap uh, today's episode. And, and yeah, I just want to thank you for sharing a bit more about your journey. Uh, it's been a privilege to, to get to know you over the years and, and look forward to continuing to do that here in the future. And so I would just uh, strongly encourage everybody to reach out to Erica Follower. She's a great leader in the space, um, deeply connected and committed to the sector. And so with that, Brent signing off with today's guest, Erica Jordan, Vice President of Alumni Engagement at Boston University. Go Terriers. Yeah.